Our Father in heaven, it is such a great privilege that we have to enter into your presence by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the work of our Savior on the cross. We thank you that it is Jesus Christ, a very God of a very God who took on human flesh and died in the place of sinners. We recognize, Lord, once again this morning that as we reflect uh, uh, as to what took place on Golgotha, that we see the heinous and the depraved nature of our sin. That we, Lord, are, are vile sinners. We are miserable sinners. And the only reason why we are saved is because of the grace and the mercy of God. Help us, Lord, we pray, not to boast in our own good works or in our own achievements, but help us to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. It is there that we find forgiveness of sins. It is there that we are accepted. It is there that we know uh, the fullness of joy and the love of our Father. Help us, Lord, never to lose sight of these things in this world where there are so many distractions that would take our attention away from the Savior whom we love. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to make a deliberate effort not to give in to these temptations, but help us, Lord, to stand firm in the midst of trial. Help us to resolve to find shelter and refuge in the wings of our Savior. Help us to run to the horn of our salvation, for you are our fortress and our God. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless us as a congregation. We thank you, Lord, for the historical work that has been established here in Witchwood. And we thank you for the uh, legacy that we have received. Help us, Lord, to be uh, godly and biblical custodians of what we have received, that we might preserve the gospel and proclaim it and hand it over to those who will follow after us. Help us, Lord, to maintain the purity of the gospel. But help us, Lord, also to model what it means to uh, love each other in a selfless and in a, uh, a godly way. Help us, Lord, not to be controlled by our emotions or our feelings, but help us to love even when we don't feel like loving. Help us to be selfless when we are tempted to be selfish. Help us, Lord, to give, give ourselves to the service of one another because of the unity that has been established by Jesus Christ. But Father, we would also want to pray this morning for uh, congregations around us who do not know or struggle to know a unity that is found in the gospel. We know, Lord, that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking those to devour. And churches, we are not surprised, are his targets. For where the church is in disarray, and when there is disunity amongst the people of God, the work of the gospel is hindered. And so we pray for churches who are struggling at this time, that you would help them to uh, not ground their identity in their preferences or in their ideas, but help them to ground their identity in what Jesus Christ has done. And we pray, Lord, that you would enable these churches to grow and prosper, and that their <coughs> example would be one of restoration and repentance and a turning back to God. And so, Father, we pray, preserve us, preserve our sister churches around us. We pray that the gospel would go forth this morning in power and conviction and full of the work of the Holy Spirit. Father, we would once again want to commit to you this morning those who are unwell. We want to pray, Lord, particularly for uh, some of our older sisters. We think, Lord, of Deirdre and Bronwyn, for... Uh, Rosemary and Loretta and Beth. We pray, Lord, also for Rosalie and Frida. We uh, pray also, Lord, for Craig's mom, for Esme. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with each of these dear saints. We pray, Lord, that you would sustain them at this time, and that you would watch over them. Help them, Lord, to be comforted by the truth of your word and the ministry of your Holy Spirit.
unless we would ask and pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now you would remember King David, a man after God's own heart, is a man who commits adultery. He is a man who murders Uriah the Hittite. He is a king who fails to discipline his own children. While he is a central figure in the books of uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, yeah, he is a man who is nevertheless one who fails. Or well, think about King Hezekiah, one of the great kings in Israel, a man who on his deathbed prayed that the Lord would restore him and God answered his prayer. King Hezekiah was a king who had unwavering confidence in God, even in the midst of great opposition. And yet King Hezekiah was a king who was undone by his pride. King Hezekiah was a failure in that particular area. What about Peter? The man who stood up on the day of Pentecost before all those Jews from many nations around Israel. 3,000 people were saved and added to the church. Peter, the first apostle to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter, the central figure in the life of the church in the first century. And Peter denied Jesus Christ. If we were to think about that in today's terms with social media and so on, you can imagine that if Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost wanting to speak, all the media outlets would have been there uh, digging up all the dirt of his past. And they would have said, oh, remember that time when Jesus said to, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Who is this man to get up and speak? Now, friends, the reason why the Bible is brutally honest about these characters is because the Bible is not about them. The Bible is not about David or Hezekiah or Peter. The Bible is about the glory of God as is revealed in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And what these people remind us of is that we too, sitting here today, we are failures. And we are broken. We are the ones who give in to sin and temptation all the days of our lives. But what this passage reminds us of, and we'll get there eventually, but what this passage reminds us of is that we serve a patient God and a perfect Savior. It is not our failure that defines us, but it is the grace and the goodness of God. I have two main points that I want to unpack this morning, although the first point has a number of sub-points. I'm sure you've seen that on our WhatsApp group. But the first is Peter's precarious position. Peter's precarious position. Look there at verse 69. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. We're going to pause there for a moment and simply ask the question, how did Peter get there? How did Peter get there? Well, we saw earlier in verse 58 of this passage, when Jesus was arrested, when he was taken before the tribunal, there we read that Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards. Uh, John, in John 18, gives us a little bit more detail. And I want for us to read that because you'll see how where Peter is located it almost sets him up for the failure that is about to come. So in John chapter 18 and from verse 15, uh, John records a little bit more as to, to what happened there. Uh, so Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. So that other disciple is John. That's how John refers to himself in the gospel. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, this is now John. So John, who was known to the high priest, went 
out and spoke to the servant girl. Remember this. So John goes out and speaks to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and then brought Peter in. So it seems as though if we were to repaint the scene, Jesus is arrested. He is taken to the, to the, court, to the courtyard of the, of the high priest. Uh, John and Peter are following. They get to the door. John's allowed inside, but he has to persuade the servant girl uh, to let him in. But one of the things that Peter doesn't do well is he, he doesn't position himself in the most strategic of places. So when you look at verse 58 of Matthew 26, it says he went inside and he sat with the guards to see the end. Now that word God is, is translated in a few different ways in, in Scripture. So in, in Matthew chapter 5, for example, remember when Jesus says, when you're going to court, come to terms with your accuser, lest he hand you over to the judge and the judge hand you over to the God. So the one who executes justice after the sentencing. That's how it's used in, in that particular instance. But in another instance, for example, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is in the synagogue and he's given the scroll of Isaiah to read, he reads from the scroll and then he gives it to the assistant. That's in John four, uh, sorry, Luke 4 verse 20. So that word, this word God is, is used in, in two ways. It's used in an official sort of the, the God who protects way, but then it's also translated as someone who's an assistant. So when we read of it here, I think what we're meant to see is that, that, that Peter locates himself in this area. There's a fire that's lit, and, and Peter is sitting in this area where there's temple assistants and temple guards all around him. Now why is that important? Well, here's the question. Who went with a cohort of Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus. Servants of the high priest, as well as the temple guard. So in all likelihood, when uh, Peter uh, enters into the courtyard of the high priest, Malchus, who was on the, on the uh, Mount of, of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, probably comes down with his third ear in his hand, and he says to the, to, the, to the people there at the fire, Guys, you wouldn't believe what happened. This is my ear, but I've got two on me already. I, you, you know, there was a, a fight and the people were falling down and Peter drew his sword. It was crazy. And then who arrives at the fire? Peter. So the people who are surrounding Peter are probably the people who may have been up uh, on the Mount of, of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane already. So they know him. They can identify him. He is perhaps in the worst place possible. And, and this verse sets the trajectory of all that's about to follow. Now, as we unpack this, there are three, no, sorry, there's four voices. There's four voices that come to Peter. And we'll look at each one of those in turn. So the first is a servant girl. Servant girl. Verse 69. And a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. Now Matthew has just told us how Jesus has stood firm in the midst of his trial with the Sanhedrin. Towards the end of that passage, we saw how Jesus faced fierce opposition and cruel treatment. And yet in the midst of all that Jesus had experienced at that trial, he stood firm, he stood resolute, he was uncompromising in his position. He will not be swayed, he will not be turned away by the threats of these men. He knows what the will of God is and he sets his face to the cross. He will not be deterred. They intend to kill him. They intend to spill his blood. And yet Jesus will be bold. Jesus will be courageous against what is perhaps the greatest authority in all Israel. He is no coward. 
He is no victim of circumstance. But he stands as a man. A man under the will of God. Now Peter, keeping himself warm by the fire, has seen this. He has seen all that Jesus has gone through. He has seen uh, the, the actions of the high priest. He has seen how they have tried to corner Christ. And there he is, keeping himself warm. And who should come to Peter but a servant girl? Now Matthew is very deliberate when he chooses his words. This servant girl, she's not an imposing figure. She doesn't hold a position of prominence. There's no ways in which a girl like this could have threatened Peter or provoke him. Perhaps it's the same servant girl who opened the door, as we read of in John's Gospel. She's a servant girl. She occupies a lowly position. And yet, when she comes to Peter and says that he's a, uh, he was with Jesus, Peter is completely undone by her accusation. He, he just crumbles at the knees. I don't know, maybe she was very pretty or something like that, but he... He, he just completely fumbles. And you, you want to think for a moment, is he that weak? Surely he should have followed Christ's example, even in the midst of the temptation that he experienced. But he denies it. The, the word deny here means to treat with disdain, to treat with contempt. To, to treat something as though it were grotesque. You're with Jesus. That's a grotesque statement to me. How could you even accuse me of that? Peter here is treating Christ, in essence, as though Christ were beneath him. As though Christ were even unworthy of his consideration. I don't know what you mean. I deny it. This is a very different Peter, isn't it? From what we've seen before. Peter previously was so bold. He made great claims of loyalty and devotion. And yet now, he is overwhelmed with fear. He is nothing less than a, a nervous wreck before the servant girl. And perhaps he's thinking to himself, he's probably thinking to himself, will I experience the same fate as what Jesus is experiencing now? Will I be beaten for identifying with Jesus? Will I be spat upon? Will I be mocked? Are these the options that I am left with? And so he denies Jesus. It's a sobering reminder, isn't it, friends, that the very best of men are men at best. Each one of us is weak. Each one of us, even after we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we stumble, we fall, we have a, a desire to accomplish great works for Jesus, we have zeal in serving Him, yeah, we so easily forget, don't we, that the flesh is weak. But there are times when sin clings so closely to us, and it, it, there's a, a particular way in which it creeps in through the cracks of our hearts, and it, it hits us in the deepest and darkest places. And we find that we have no strength. As we look at Peter, we must never think to ourselves that we could have done better. I wonder if Peter uh, read Romans 7, Remember, uh, maybe when, when the letter of Romans was published and was being circulated, if, if uh, Peter read that. And you'd remember uh, uh, Paul, when he writes in, in uh, Romans 7, so Romans 7 and verse 15, uh, he, he speaks there about the tension that exists in his body as he fights against sin. Uh, 
<clears throat> and he says in Romans 7 and verse 15, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. I wonder if, if, if Peter, when he read that, thought to himself, Yeah, that's me. When I, when I was in the courtyard of the high priest, I didn't want to deny Jesus Christ. I didn't want to turn my back on Him. I wanted to be loyal. I, I wanted to display my commitment to my Savior. But I didn't even understand my own actions at that time. Then we can be thankful, can't we, for a, a passage like John 20. Where even after Peter's an absolute failure, who restores him? It is Christ. In gentleness and patience, He's restored. But that's not where we are here. That still comes later on. We, in fact, we're going to be thinking about that a little bit next week. But uh, here, is, here is Peter, servant girl. A girl that occupies a lowly position. She comes to Peter and yet he denies Jesus. Says she was the first voice. The second voice is another servant girl. In verse 71. And he went out to the entrance... And another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, Standers, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now Peter is obviously feeling awkward. He's sitting around this fire. And, and you know, of course, that there's no electricity in Jerusalem at the time. And so perhaps this fire is illuminating his, his face. And so he thinks to himself, let me remove myself to a, a less well-lit area. Maybe put my robe on my head or whatever the case might be so that people will not recognize me. And so he moves uh, to the entrance of the courtyard, perhaps away from the crowd as well. But even while he is there, while he is finding a secluded place, another servant girl arrives. But this time she begins speaking to others, perhaps those who are scattered about. This man, we've seen him before, this man, this man was with Jesus. You think the second time round, after Peter's been found out, he would have a different response. Well, how does Peter respond? Verse 72, and again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. Well, this is quite remarkable. What Peter is doing here, in essence, as he's communicating to the people around him, he's basically saying, I'm calling God as my witness to bear witness to what I'm saying to you. Now, as we read it, we understand it as Peter is saying, God, you bear witness to my lies. God, who is a God of truth, God, who is the author of truth, Peter now calls upon the Lord to bear witness to his falsehood. There, there's no reverence here, is there? There's no understanding of what um, uh, Christ has come to do, or even what God is like. I mean, in the Old Testament, he would have been severely punished if he had been found out on the basis of this. I mean, had, had, had Peter forgotten what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? He said, do not... Swear by the, the temple or by, uh, or by the heavens, for that is the throne of God. But simply let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Had he forgotten that that was to characterize a disciple? Honesty. And yet now Peter calls the Lord to bear witness to his lies. He's calling God to lie for him. The Lord is patient, isn't He? And we'll see even in our next passage how Peter deserves nothing less than to be struck down. And yet the Lord is patient. So we looked at the servant girl, and then we looked at another servant girl. Now let's look at the bystanders. <clears throat> After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. <clears throat> 
Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22 and verse 59 that this was about an hour uh, between the second and third accusation. But you can imagine, can't you? So, so Peter's in this courtyard, the trial is taking place. He's removed himself from the fire to go to the entrance. And within this period of an hour, rumors begin to spread. Maybe Peter even watches this servant girl move from one group to another. And he can see how the entire group shifts their eyes towards him. They're looking at him, trying to discern who is this man. But not only does he see their eyes turn toward him, maybe he hears his name being whispered among them. Very uncomfortable for him to be experiencing that. The, the pressure now is mounting. Eventually they come up to Peter and they say to him, Hey man, we know it's you. Yeah, maybe one of them said, You know, I remember that time. You, Peter, you were, you were with Jesus when he fed all those people. And, and you were one of those guys that still went around and, and, and picked up all those Leftovers. You guys had like 12 baskets or something left over from that boy's lunch pack. And we've seen you before. And now when we heard you speaking to that other girl, your, your accent, we know you're not from around here. You're a Galilean. And Peter, we, we know that you associated with this man. G give up the ruse. Give, put aside the mask. Well, this time Peter's very agitated. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. He's basically saying, if I am lying to you, God should strike me down right now. I mean, he's so brazen to speak in that way. I mean, wasn't Peter the guy on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus peeled away, as it were, his earthly veil and he saw the radiance of the second person of the Trinity. Moses and Elijah was there. And God the Father spoke. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And now, Peter is saying that that God should strike him down if he is lying. It's remarkable for him to think in that way. That's why I say, I wonder if he read Romans 7 and he said, I didn't understand what I was doing. That's how consuming sin was in my life at that point. But notice also how he refers to Jesus. And he's done this already. He says to them, I do not know the man. Hey, so is that what Jesus is reduced to now, Peter? He is simply... The man. The, the man over there. Was it not Peter who followed Christ for three years? It was it not Peter when Christ said to him, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Peter left everything and followed Christ. Did Peter not see his miracles? Had Peter not been the recipient of mercy and kindness from the hand of Jesus Christ? Was it not Peter who was the first to say, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now, Jesus is simply the man. That's who Jesus is reduced to. I wonder if that's true for you today. Yeah, some of you sitting here. As you come to church and you just listen to these sermons... You hear the gospel over and over again. I wonder if for you, after you hear about the glory of Jesus Christ, you simply say to, you, to yourself, well, he's just the man. He's just the victim on the pages of history. Someone who was killed and crucified by the Romans, but that's all there is to him. He's simply the man. That's who Jesus is reduced to. Nothing more. Let's look at the fourth voice. Well, there's a fourth voice here. And you might say, well, where do we find that? Well, it's at the end of verse 74. It's the voice of the rooster. 
And immediately the rooster crowed. The sound which Peter never wanted to hear at this moment. Two servant girls and the bystanders come to him. He rejects Jesus. A rooster crows and his heart is pierced. He realizes what he's done. He's denied Christ. He's denied Christ. He's denied Christ. And when he hears this rooster crow, this man's broken. He remembered what Jesus said and he leaves and he weeps. The weight of what he has done is crushing. He's no longer a man who's concerned about what people think about him. He's consumed with sorrow and he leaves with tears in his eyes. So then let's think about Peter's repentant posture. This is the second point, Peter's repentant posture. So often we speak about Peter denying Christ. Very rarely do we speak about his tears. If you were to reflect upon Peter's character, he is in in many ways... uh, A man who's rough around the edges. He's he's very uh, boisterous. He says things that simply come to mind. He's a man, but he's he's rough around the edges. And and typically, when you meet men like that, I often tease and I say, well, they've got the emotional capacity of a teaspoon. Uh, They don't respond to very much. They're, They're very loud. They're very out there. But they don't show a lot of emotions. The fact that we have this recorded for us, that Peter went out and wept bitterly, shows us a man who is broken as he acknowledges the sin that has consumed his life. When was the last time you saw someone respond to sin in that way? When was the last time you responded to your sin in that way. We can be hard-heartened to when we hear the gospel. We can reject the gospel every time it's, it's preached to us. We can do things willfully that we know are opposed to God's will for us. But when we come to the realization of what we have done, what does our repentance look like? More often than not, it's just some kind of acknowledgement of, yeah, I've I've done something wrong, I've committed this sin, and I'm just going to move on, as though we're brushing it under the carpet. But do we realize that we have transgressed a holy God? Do we realize that we have treated with disdain the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus in our lives? We continue to to put off and put off and put off. And we don't want to realize the extent of what we have done. And Peter, in this moment, helps us to see what true sorrow looks like. It's not simply a half-hearted apology and then we carry on from there. Are we burdened by our sin that nails Christ to the cross? I want to show you one more thing from this passage. And that is the severity of Peter's death. Luke chapter 22 and from verse 31. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. That he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You see, we see servant girls and bystanders. What we are meant to see 
lurking even further back in the shadows, is Satan himself unraveling the faith of Peter. The word demanded here in verse 31 is a word that's only used once in the Bible. And it means to demand a right to something. And so the idea that we're meant to have here, we don't know how this happens, we aren't told, but the idea is that Satan is standing before God in some way, and he is saying to God, I have a right to take Peter and to do what I want to him. I have a right to do that. That's the picture that we're to have in our minds. Maybe it was like what we see in the book of Job. As I said, we aren't told. But that's the intensity with which Peter, with, what, with which Satan wants to uh, cause Peter to stumble. And so what he does in that courtyard with those groups of people what he wants to do is really deconstruct Peter's faith. He wants to strip everything away. The reason why, and we see it behind these words, is because Peter, we know, occupied a, a position of leadership even amongst the disciples. He was the spokesperson of those who are around him. And Satan knows that if he can get this man to fall, if he can get this man to turn away from Christ and turn his back on him, then all others will follow. That's the same way that Satan operates today. I'm sure you've heard more and more of uh, Christian leaders who will suddenly say that, well, they're, they're re-looking at their faith and they're deconstructing as an evangelical Christian or whatever the case might be. Why do you think that's the case? Who's at work in the background? Satan. Because he knows that if he can get leaders in the church of God to turn their backs upon Christ, so many others will turn away as well. But it's not just the way that he operates amongst Christian leaders, but it's the same way that he works in your life, in my life, wherever you may be. Why, was, why did Peter respond in the way that he did? Well, he was afraid that he might get treated in the same way that Christ was treated. Or we might experience fear uh, when we're asked to affiliate ourselves with Jesus Christ, whether it's in our school or in our workplaces. Perhaps we don't want to experience shame because we'll be mocked by our friends or those who work around us. All those things are nothing less than the schemes of Satan. His tactics are at work in the world around us. And slowly he begins to chisel away at our faith. Think about it with Peter. Jesus told him. Peter, you will deny me. What did uh, Peter respond by saying, Lord, I will never deny you. Though they may all fall away, I never will. That was the first step in his downward trajectory. Peter, pray with me. And all he saw was a comfy rock to lean his head upon. It's a slow decline. Satan chisels and chisels and chisels away at us. I was reading again just last night uh, some uh, portions from the screw tape letters. I've mentioned that to you before about these two demons, uh, Wormwood and Screw Tape, and how Wormwood is writing to Screw Tape, uh, advising him how to corrupt uh, the Christian. And he says to him, It takes years. It's the slow, slow chiseling away at the faith of a Christian that caused them to stumble. Peter fails miserably. He has denied Christ three times. But I wonder, did you see those words of reassurance in John's Gospel? comes to us in verse 32. Jesus says to, to Peter, I have prayed for you 
I have prayed for you. I wonder if while Peter is experiencing this, while simultaneously Jesus is on trial, if even at that point, Jesus was praying for Peter. Because in verse 34 of Luke 22, there we, we read that, um, or uh, elsewhere, later on in Luke, we read that when the rooster crowed, Jesus looked up and saw Peter. <coughs> Jesus Christ intercedes for this miserable, weak failure of a man. Robert Murray McShane, uh, he said, and I think this is of, of such encouragement to us, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. And that is something that every Christian needs to remember. It is Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us. So though Satan tempt me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Though Satan should buffet, Though trials should come, let this calm assurance control that uh, Christ has taken our sin upon Himself and has shed His own blood for my soul. When we face temptation, when our faith is on the line, it is Christ who holds us. It is Christ who preserves us in the darkness. And as believers, we must draw confidence from that. We must draw assurance from that. We must stand boldly. We must speak clearly as we rely on the intercession of our Savior. Well, the night has ended. Interestingly, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Peter is never mentioned again. This is the last time that we hear of him. When morning comes, the Sanhedrin gather again together and they sentence Christ. They tie his hands and they deliver him to Pilate. It's the end now, isn't it? Christ has been betrayed by Jesus. Oh, sorry, Christ has been betrayed by Judas. He has been judged by the Sanhedrin. He has been denied by Peter. He will be sentenced by Pilate and he will be crucified by us because it is our sin that nails him to the tree. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Just have a few moments of silence and then we'll close our time. Our Lord and our God, we would come before you now recognizing our weakness. Knowing that none of us can stand unless we stand upon Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Lord, for those times when we feel as though we have failed you. Recognizing, Lord, that some of us here, even this morning, may feel like Peter. We have not spoken when we have had opportunities to do so. We have been silent even when Christ has been mocked. But we thank you that you are the one to restore us. We thank you that it is our Lord Jesus who is so patient and so kind and so gentle with us fallen and weak sinners. Help us, Lord, we pray, to stand firm upon our Savior and to rest upon him. Lord, as we even now come to the communion table, we thank you for this 
wonderful reminder of what Jesus has done. That he has shed his blood and that he has given his body as the ransom price for sinners. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to approach the table with humility. Help us, Lord, to come to this meal with a sense of reverence, trusting in Christ and Christ alone. Amen.